Um, and the, frame, the framework for this panel uh, and for this conversation uh, is that Volunteer Ottawa wants to be here uh, with the community as we recover from these past two years. Uh, so we look forward to, to, to continuing these conversations and perhaps, and perhaps have different types of meetings with, with uh, organizations and, and leaders in the sector to actually to, to, to continue the, the, the road to recovery or the, the, the pathways in the, in the plural to recovery together. So um, you might have read their bios in our invitation, uh, but I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, introduce our panelists today. And we have with us Alice Dabro, uh, who's the founder of Mon Monday Morning, uh, a modern HR consultancy firm building HR operations from the ground, from the ground up and providing custom HR solutions that work for people and businesses. Thank you, Alice, for joining us and welcome. We also have with us Lola dubé Quaibel, who has over 30 years of experience in the sector, which also includes a longstanding association with Volunteer Ottawa. She's currently Ottawa Public Health's coordinator of volunteer resources. Thank you, Lola, for being with us and welcome. And we also have Brianna Pizzuto, uh, who has degrees from the University of Ottawa in health sciences and psychology, and has vast experience in roles in healthcare and social services. And since 2018, she uh, is uh, the lead and founder of Talk Tools. Thank you, Brianna, for, for joining us. Last but not least, <laughs> here with us today is also Adam James, uh, Adam James, who you may know, uh, volunteer manager extraordinaire and uh, our uh, our director of programs here uh, and the, of programs and fund development here at Volunteer Ottawa who will be helping uh, sort of monitor the chat and, and facilitate uh, this conversation. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to start uh, by posing some questions to our panelists. So I will start with Lola and then I will move on to Alice and Brianna. Uh, it's really hard to overstate the impact that the pandemic has had on everyone's lives uh, and in the non uh, in the not for profit sector in particular just for reference the cbc just ran a cbc ottawa just ran a feature last weekend highlighting the impact uh, of of the pandemic on the sector uh, uh, with with a, with, a, with a focus on a couple of organizations uh, so uh, some staff in organizations have been struggling uh, as many Ottawa citizen, uh, residents have uh, with the multi-directional challenges that, that this context has brought on us. Also, um, volunteer recruitment and retention has also been quite challenging because of uh, various public health measures uh, and, uh, and just, just because of, uh, of the, the pandemic context and the, the, the distancing context and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so considering how many organizations in our sector rely on volunteers to fulfill, fulfill their mandate, we wanted to talk about volunteer engagement and volunteer management in this context. And that's why we brought Lola to this panel. That's why we invited her. So Lola, going to, to the question I wanted to pose to you as an experienced volunteer coordinator, what do you think can be done from the perspective of organizations working with volunteers to re-engage to reconnect, uh, to re-motivate, and along these lines to recover uh, after these challenging two years. Thank you, Alvaro. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak about one of my favorite topics, volunteers. You ever want to talk to me about something, start with the word volunteer and I'm there. So I'm really pleased to be sharing uh, the round table with the, um, pan the other panelists and with everyone who's really interested in volunteers that help provide services to the residents of this community. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about public health and how we are thinking of doing the recovery of our volunteer resources program. So the first piece that I wanted to talk about was um, when, when you're talking to them or when you're getting them to come back in, whatever, showing that empathy, the patience with them, Taking, making sure they feel secure and comfortable in the present 
the president, the presence, sorry, of the staff and the people around them, giving them confidence that you're taking care of things and that they don't need to worry. So that's the first thing. And I actually wrote myself a note saying, do some consultation with the volunteers you know, have that little conversation where they tell you the little bit their story. Why haven't you been here for two years? Or is there a particular reason that you're not very comfortable? And you don't know if you want to come back or even um, we don't use ex we don't we didn't use exit questionnaires for volunteers who left us. But that doesn't mean that we can't use some of those questions to go back and say, hey, I noticed that you didn't uh, sign up for a particular event. Is there something that I can do to get you back on board, right? So that kind of thing. Making sure that the volunteers are provided with the information to make informed choices. At public health, we make sure that everybody realizes that you have to have been vaccinated, that you have to wear a mask, that you have to try to stay, you know, the six feet away from another person. And we'll provide masks if we need to. We've moved desks around. We've actually changed our physical environment to make it safer for volunteers so that when they come in, they realize that we've made that effort to get them on board and that we appreciate their contribution. Uh, the other thing that we tell them is we keep them up to date with the latest news and the latest changes, right? I mean, we're starting to relax the use of masks in certain locations, right? And uh, while this is a workplace and we have to have masks, that doesn't mean they need to wear it everywhere. So we make sure that they have that information, that they're kept informed. Um, the other thing that we do is we do provide them with information about going to get tested if they're worried that they might have it or that somebody close to them has it so that they're not left trying to on the phone trying to make an appointment or do any of those things. We also talk about what kind of communications do they want a regular updates like once a month do they want a newsletter do they just want an email saying hey guys we need volunteers to help us out with this event contact me and then I'll send you all the details or do you want like a whole repetition, wear your mask, all of those things so that we we um, customize the communication to the volunteers because we want to make sure that they want to re-engage, they want to come back. Um, we also, we also, I, I emphasize the benefits, right? And benefits things like references for volunteering and professional development um, opportunities that I can invite them to with the staff at Ottawa Public Health if they're interested in the medical field so that they feel included and that they want to be part of it. Um, and also providing them with a feedback loop. How can you get back to, to us for things that you've seen or things that you think should be addressed? So I create that feedback loop. Doesn't necessarily have to come back from me, but I do make sure that they have that conduit. And if they want to contribute something, they can. Now we've had a bit of challenges. And one of them was there was a reduction in requests for volunteers from the staff. So all of a sudden, you know, there was, it was a job to keep the volunteers occupied, because there was a reduction in placements. So then, you know, I get I went back to the volunteers and said, Hey, guys, there's less requests for volunteers. What is it that I can keep do with you to keep you you know, engaged and interested in volunteering for public health. So we came up with things like, you know, sending a birthday card or sending, a, you know, thinking about you card or whatever electronically. And then I just kept them in the loop and then every once in a while send a newsletter. So we did that kind of thing. And then um, I do want to emphasize that when I send out a request for a placement, it really talks about the requirement for the placement. And therefore, we have a diverse population that applies and that um, there's um, I, I, we're, we're really following the accessibility piece. The only time that I have a concern is if it's not wheelchair accessible and then but otherwise anyone from any you know, part of life can volunteer at Ottawa Public Health as long as they're over 16. Uh, we still make volunteers sign all the documentation. We can't get out of that. And then one of the pieces of documentation is confirming with me, you did get your vaccinations. I can't get over that. Then I also talk about, you know, what is it that you're going to be telling your clients? Because they're going to ask you questions. They're going to want to know, well, can we do this? Or, oh, are you supposed to touch me or any of those questions? And then we provide a bit of that training so that they realize 
how to respond. And if they don't know the answer, don't respond. Tell them that you're going to get back to them or that public health will get back to them in response to that question. Because I want to make sure that there's, you know, a, a correct answer and that we always err on the side of caution. We use the word an abundance of caution now that we have COVID-19, but I, I use the other term for volunteers. I also ask staff and the volunteers here on the site that we have an atmosphere of congeniality, you know, and uh, that we work collegially so that they're included as team members and not anyone saying, well, that's just a volunteer. I don't want to hear that ever. And we don't use volunteers. We engage involve volunteers. And that difference in language makes a big difference when we get the volunteers in here. The other thing I do is I try to help them to be open, the volunteers to be open to change because things change all the time. One day I can have you come in and work for four hours. The next day uh, I can't have you come in for whatever reason. It's just so to be aware of that constant change and to be there to coach and mentor when they need that extra help to keep them involved in what we're doing because it's communication. It's that personal touch with each and every volunteers. And I have to tell you, I have 209 volunteers on my roster right now. So the personal touch is very hard, but at the same time, not everybody needs it. But I think it is something that's very important and touching base with the volunteers and being available is truly, really important. And what I'm hopeful for in terms of what's coming up is we're not going to use the words, and I wrote it, ah, re-engage, reconnect, re-motivate and recover. We're going to, we're going to use the words, engage, connect, motivate, and cover all of the requirements of the residents of the city of Ottawa, because the volunteers are going to get that recharge from the managers of volunteers in the community. And since there's so many of you, I know that everybody's going to be on that particular uh, stairway and help to bring things to normalize a little bit the situation. We have to accept the new the new times. We have to accept the changes to our society. But at the same time, if we can minimize the risks to volunteers, and if we can minimize the impact of changes, then what we're doing is we're really being um, conscientious in our manage of, management of the volunteers. And we're also being um, professionals in the management of volunteers. So I don't know if I've spoken 10 minutes or not. I can't tell, I talk so fast. <laughs> um, I'm just going to ask if anyone had any questions, did someone want more details? I have several pages of notes, but I tend to go very slow. So uh, very slow in, in uh, responding to questions. So um, we we will do the Q and A. Uh, so if you have questions for Lola, uh, please note them that not note them down. Even you can you can note them in the chat, and we will go over them uh, at the uh, after we do the everyone's interventions. But thank you, thank you, Lola, for for all those really important concepts. Uh, just to recap, some of the things that you some of the recommendations you gave uh, was trainings, touch base. And motivate, sort of hi highlight the benefits of volunteering in the in the community and how that offsets some of the of the risks in the in the in the current situation. So I think that all all of have being patient and empathetic with with our volunteers. So all all of those all of those uh, concepts I think are very important, and very actionable for for everyone here. And I'm sure there will be more more questions. Uh, we also wanted to to talk about today. Um, about uh, folks working, uh, either staff uh, in the in the in in stricto sensu, or or volunteer staff working in in organizations, uh, and that's why the reason why one of the reasons why we we called uh, Alice to be part of this um, of this of this panel. So um, I wanted uh, perhaps Alice, you can tell us a little bit more. Uh, about uh, some of the ways that folks in the uh, in the in the sector working with staff, uh, managers, coordinators, etc., et can build a workplace that is conducive to to recovering well, as as we when we entitled this uh, this panel. Where are some of the best practices that, from your perspective, can can be implemented across the sector? 
Uh, another follow-up question that I had, and you might want to, to touch on, is like how can people in the sector address uh, the challenges in the workplace that the pandemic has, has brought and that have affected disproportionately, uh, for instance, women. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I thought we thought that that was re re a very important aspect uh, of, uh, of, of your intervention, if you wanted to, to talk about that too. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much uh, for that, um, Alvaro. So I will say that, you know, as we start to resume some form of normalcy in our day-to-day -day and working lives, um, the world of work that we have traditionally been used to has really seen some dra drastic, drastic shifts over the past two years. Um, I mean, some of the unfortunate themes that we've seen is just increase in isolation. Um, and one of the biggest ones is actually uh, the pandemic is leading to a great deal of burnout. So we all know this great resignation, which has been fueled in many ways, um, and in many cases by staff feeling burnt out. Burnout has impacted many individuals, but we see it highly prevalent um, in parents of young children, um, in particular, mothers of young children. Uh, the not-for-profit space, um, being a heavily female-dominated sector, has definitely felt the impact of women leaving the workforce in droves. Uh, the not-for-profit sector is also particularly vulnerable to burnout um, because many of the roles are servicing those in marginalized communities, many of whom were the most vulnerable to COVID-19, and then having to carry the weight of their job responsibilities while also managing their own personal demands. So it's sort of like a double whammy there. Um, but there's definitely things that employers and managers should keep in mind when it comes to finding ways to help their team recover and support their teams. So we'll start with just, you know, very basically listening to your people, right? So I can't state how critical this is. Um, you have to make sure you spend time asking people how they're doing, do their current work benefits and work structures still resonate? What are people looking for? What are the needs of your staff? Uh, an employee survey, even just to get a pulse of how things are going is a great way to gather data to help inform your benefits, policies, work structure, and ensure that your organization is still fit for purpose. And once you gather all of that data, have a look at your leadership. Does your current leadership team have the skills needed to support the new needs of your staff? And if not, how do we invest in upskilling those folks so that they have the same and right competencies to be able to take the organization into the future? Uh, regular check-ins. So managers need to keep <clears throat> a constant pulse of how their team is doing. So regularly scheduled weekly or bi-weekly check-ins are so important for this reason. And not only should the discussion focus on the work, but you really need to make sure you carve out time to find out how people are doing. Ask how you as a manager can also help to support them and normalize this practice. Um, you'd be surprised by what people are willing to share just by offering the question shows that you're invested in their well-being. And paying attention to employees creates overall a supportive work environment, which helps to retain talent. And we all know that there's more of a need than ever with the current talent shortage that we're facing. Um, in a similar vein to what Lola had mentioned, communication. Stuff is changing so rapidly. The rules, the restrictions, the new world of work, ongoing and constant internal communication can help alleviate a lot of the anxiety that comes with change and give people time to process the information. It can also make them feel like they're coming along for the change journey and have a part in shaping it instead of just being told that this is what we're outright doing now. Uh, it's also important for organizations to be flexible with their policies and practices. The old ways of doing things just no longer cut it. Your people now want flexibility. They want to have their needs taken into consideration. After two years of working remotely, asking people to come back into the office, even on a hybrid model, is challenging. It's again asking people to reshift everything in their lives to make this work. And realistically, the pandemic is... I mean, I think we all know this to some extent, but it gave people the time to really think about what they wanted out of their lives, out of their jobs, and their priorities are just so different now than what they were two years ago. So in recognizing that people want different things and want greater control of their schedule and time, and also that things are in flux, and if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's the importance of staying nimble and open to change. We're still seeing things change on a day-to-day -day basis, and realistically, we might actually be looking at you know, coming in and out of restrictions uh, over the next couple of years, right? I don't really think we're sort of out of the woods yet. But for those who have started to return to the office, provide flexibility if staff need to work from home outside of their normal schedule, 
In fact, be proactive and plan for this to ensure that there's always a plan in place, whether that's team coverage or flexibility with deadlines, so that the work doesn't fall through the cracks and that you don't also have staff members then feeling guilty or stressed or overwhelmed for having to take time off due to any sort of extenuating circumstances. Mental health support. <clears throat> so look into carving out some time and a budget for mental health support. So I've seen clients engage with social workers, bringing them in for mental health sessions for staff. Um, Not Myself Today is also a great organization with a lot of wonderful resources. And I know CAMH also offers great resources, including toolkits, which you can access off their website. Um, and lastly, I would say just encourage staff to take time off. We've seen that because of travel restrictions, um, people have all this banked vacation time and are not actually using it. Um, make a concerted effort to ask your team to bring forward their holiday plans for the year so that we're holding people, we're putting it a top of mind for individuals to actually carve out that time that they need to actually recharge and just disconnect from work. And as an employee, you should really be doing the same. Look at your entitlements, ensure you take, um, you prioritize your health and take much needed breaks from the workplace. The other thing that I think, um, maybe we didn't actually touch upon this um, in your questions, Alvaro, but one of the, the biggest things we've sort of seen um, shift is this huge shift in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in really in all sectors. Um, and we aren't really just talking about performative efforts like ensuring 30% of your staff complement or racialized. We're talking about real work in this area. So looking deep at systemic issues of discrimination, decolonization, learning, and unlearning. This work is challenging and it's uncomfortable and while deeply important, has shifted what we expect from our employers. And in our recovery efforts, we need to put the individual at the forefront and consider people's intersectional identities. A woman, for instance, will face certain forms of oppression in our society. A woman who is racialized faces additional layers of oppression. And a woman, for instance, who is racialized and queer faces additional layers of, of oppression. So <clears throat> someone's intersectional identity has a profound impact on how they experience the world and the types of challenges they will face on a daily basis. For equity to work, you really have to look at how you've done things in the past. Ask why are things done this way? Who has an advantage in this process? And who has been excluded from this process? And these principles and questions will help to guide your thinking on how to truly create equity in the workplace. It's really important for employers really now to do work in this area because it's again transformed people's expectations of what they want from their employers and what they expect from the workplace. Um, you need to really look at how your practices, policies and procedures are shaped and how to truly create inclusivity. Thank you, thank you, Alice. So a lot of, a lot of very important uh, uh, actionable advice there that Adam has been has been summing up. Um, I have some follow up questions, but uh, I'll, I'll leave them for the for for the Q and A uh, part of the of the um, conversation. And also, I'm I'm, sh I'm sh positive that folks in the audience also have uh, questions. But thank you very much for for all that uh, wisdom. I, I think everyone everyone will will uh, leave the conversation with uh, a lot of uh, actionable points to to bring into their their uh, the workplace uh, both as as employee employers as, as and as employees and volunteers as well. Um, so uh, Brianna, I wanted uh, to to move uh, to speak to we wanted to speak to you about of course the the challenges that the pandemic has brought uh, on mental health. Just to mention a survey by Ottawa Public Health, uh, two out of five residents uh, of, of the city rated their mental health as fair or poor during 2020. Uh, and more than half of those survey were concerned about burnout, uh, as uh, Alice mentioned in the in the workplace. So with this data in mind, and also thinking like I sometimes I don't like to 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 cite data because it sounds a little bit impersonal. Uh, uh, but I, I guess that the numbers kind of reflect the the the, the magnitude of the crisis. Uh, perhaps you can introduce us to some some of your thoughts and especially some practices uh, that we can bring into our organizations to to recover uh, on a, on a better footing from from these years of of challenges and disruptions. Many of of these challenges and disruptions 
have been uh, mentioned by Lola and, and Alice by now, stress, burnout, uh, anxiety about uh, guide, guidelines and compliance. Uh, so uh, with, without further ado, I, I, I guess that, that, that the question, it's, it's not necessarily a question, it's more like a, an invitation to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Alvaro, and th thank you to uh, Alvaro and Adam and Volunteer Ottawa for inviting me here, and thank you to all of you for spending an hour, choosing to spend an hour. I know it's a gorgeous day here in Ottawa, so I'm appreciative that you chose to be here when you could easily be somewhere else right now. It's also nice to see some familiar names and faces that I wasn't expecting to be here today, so thank you for being here. Alvaro, great, uh, great question. I think I could pretty much say ditto what Alice just said, but I'll dig in a little bit deeper to some of the pieces that Alice just mentioned in specifically four different areas of challenges. Like you mentioned, burnout, definitely one of them. Uh, I've seen numbers coming out in 2021, 50% of Canadians reported struggling with their mental health. I always say, I, I think the other 50% were probably lying because we've all had challenges during the pandemic in one way or another. Uh, and then one in three Canadians screening positive for either anxiety, major depression, or PTSD right now, which is massive. Those are our three biggest mental illness diagnoses that we see in Canada. And those numbers have spiked, particularly in youth, ages 15 to 24. If you're doing any youth work or you're working for a nonprofit in the youth world, you probably already know this. So let's talk about factors that we might want to notice uh, and be aware of in our workplaces with staff and with volunteers. There's six factors, primary factors that lead to burnout. First of all, excessive workload. And I'm not just talking about in your busy time of year that every industry has, but around the clock. It can the work actually be accomplished in the time that's allotted to your staff or your volunteers. A lack of personal control over a schedule or decisions that affects people. Uh, especially during the pandemic, I think one of the, the triggers of a lot of the anxiety that many of us are feeling is that as human beings, we really don't love uncertainty. Our brains want to pick up on information, categorize it, predict an outcome, and move forward. And none of us have been able to predict any outcomes. We've got changing information all the time, not to mention all the other stuff going on in the world, wars and gas prices and people losing jobs and losing family members and grief that are piled on top of that right now. So if your staff were already facing a lack of personal control in the workplace and then pile on a lack of control pretty much in all areas of our lives, a lot of people are feeling a lot of anxiety right now. Another risk factor for burnout is a lack of compensation or appreciation. So compensation, particularly when we're talking about staff, but appreciation is another way of compensating volunteers. And we need to be especially mindful that they know that they're appreciated for the work that they're doing, like Lola mentioned. A lack of leadership, are our leaders modeling boundaries or are they modeling burnout culture? There's a really big difference there. And when a leader feels comfortable to stand up and speak about their own mental health, set an example, share resources and model boundaries, we're gonna see staff and volunteer teams that feel much more comfortable to adopt that themselves. If we've got a leader who is not comfortable talking about mental health, is not supportive of their staff, is not modeling work-life boundaries, it's really hard for staff teams to start to set those precedents for themselves because they're worried about losing their jobs. Do we have a hostile work environment? Do people have the things that they need in their work environment? Is there gossip happening? Are there clicks happening? Um, many people were hired during the pandemic and have never actually worked in person with their colleagues. So they haven't had the opportunity to build the same kinds of relationships, be in an office, we think of our university aged folks entering the workforce in the last two years, some of them may never have worked in an office before and have no idea what that's like. And so that's gonna be a whole level of learning as well. And then the sixth factor of burnout is lifestyle factors. So sleep, hygiene, diet, exercise, social supports and work-life balance. You'll know if you're having burnout in your workplace, if you've got a high turnover, if you've got substance use interfering with performance, if you've got high absenteeism, people not showing up, calling in sick last minute, being late, if you've got directives that are not being followed or are blatantly being ignored, if you've got deadlines that are not being met, if office politics are interfering with performance, 
if there's a general sense of hopelessness or lack of motivation on the team, if people are being secretive, and if threats seem to be your best motivators, these are all really key signs that your staff are experiencing burnout. The second challenge I've seen anyway is the isolation, lack of community. We as human beings are meant to be in community with each other and the forced isolation of lockdowns and working remotely, even though working remotely, I believe has a lot of benefits for people, we're lacking that ability to create relationships with each other and everybody is really craving that. So whatever we can do in our efforts to recover that focuses around building community, even if it's virtual or you're getting back in person and like Lola said, helping people feel safe, safe, not just physically, but also psychologically. Do people feel like they can show up and express to their colleagues how they're really feeling? Or it, do we need to put our mask on when we come to company events? Um, our work or volunteer events centered around alcohol. That's never a great idea. If you've got folks who struggle with substance use and maybe use it as a coping strategy, having a happy hour on Friday afternoon sounds like a great idea, but can actually be encouraging some unhealthy or maladaptive coping strategies. Um, are there regular check-ins happening? And the more psychological safety that we can embed into business as usual, the less work on your part as a leader and the more that it just becomes a habit for your teams. So check-ins at the beginnings of their shift or the beginnings of staff meetings, maybe an open drop-in time where they know your door is gonna be open and they can come talk to you, maybe a more formal one-on-one. -on -one. I've even heard of employers assigning a mentor to new staff that kind of show them the ropes and help them get integrated in the first six months or year of joining the job. That's all gonna help create the community that people need to feel like they're a part of something bigger. At the end of the day, your staff or volunteers are more likely to show up, even if they're not quite feeling it, if they know that they're part of something bigger and they know what value they're providing to the team and it's up to the leaders to show that to them. Work-life balance flew out the window for a lot of us when all of a sudden work started happening at home. Are we working at home or are we living at work was a really big question for a lot of people. Um, Work-life balance is being mindful of communication outside of work hours, um, not sending communication outside of work hours, or at least I've, I've heard some managers putting a caveat right at the top of their email that says, I'm working in the evening today, which accommodates my schedule. I'm not expecting you to respond to this until you're back on the clock tomorrow. Because now that we have our laptops, work laptops at home, for some people it's right on their dining room table, luring them in in the evenings to check emails. We need to give people permission that we're not expecting them to work around the clock. Um, the other thing, a uh, really great tip I follow myself and I encourage to everyone is a transition ritual. We lost this when we lost our commute. So we used to have a space of time where we would commute in the morning, whether you walked or you drove or you took public transit, you could read on the bus or take a nap, you could walk and get some exercise. You could listen to the radio or have a phone call in your car, but now most of us stand up and we're just home. We don't have that time to transition out of work or into work. Uh, so a transition ritual is something, doesn't have to be long, even five minutes, that signals that you're done your day before you just jump, jump into chores or jump into picking the kids up. Um, for me, I'm on camera most days, so I'm dressed professionally, but best believe at the end of the day, my hair is up in a ponytail, my comfy clothes come on. And that's my signal that I'm done with work and it's personal time now. For some people, it might be making a cup of tea and sitting for five whole minutes, not allowing yourself to move or do anything, just sit. For some people, it's a walk around the block or completing a small chore. For some people, it's showering and washing the day off and having a fresh start. We need to create that time to separate work and home. Otherwise, the lines get blurry. And lastly, dealing with this uncertainty that I mentioned earlier, um, clearly communicating changes, even communicating when you don't have an answer yet, but letting the team know hey folks, I don't have an answer yet, but when I do, I'll let you know, can help quell some of that anxiety. Rumor mills start when people start to make up stories about what's happening. And it's really dangerous when people trust the rumor mill more than they trust their manager. And the way we curb that is by communicating regularly, building trust by being consistent and dependable. 
we trust people that we know we can rely on. So are you having consistent expectations of your team? Are you not just talking the talk, but actually walking the walk? Your staff and volunteers know if you're saying we prioritize mental health and wellness, but then you're calling them outside of work hours or you're overworking them on double shifts or you're not respecting their days off, um, they're, they're going to get the picture that you're not putting where your money, your money where your mouth is and they're not going to build that trust that they need. 64% of Canadians don't feel that they can rely on the emotional support of their supervisor. And considering how much time we spend with each other in the workplace, as a supervisor or as a colleague, you're best positioned to notice changes when people are struggling and to offer support in many different ways to the folks that we all care about and are in relationship with day in and day out in our work or volunteering. I could go on and on. I have like a all these things always swirling in my brain, but I think maybe that's my 10 minutes. So I'll pass back over to Alvaro for questions and certainly uh, feel free to get in touch with me outside of today if you wanna continue this conversation. Thank you, thank you, Brianna. I think again, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of complementary uh, advice and a lot of reinforcement between what our three panelists have said. Uh, how, for example, can we incorporate uh, some of the some of the aspects about equity that Alice was mentioning into these daily check-ins, for instance, or adjust uh, or, or or model uh, as as lead, those who are in leadership responsibilities model equity uh, as as part of modeling this these types of, of behaviors that Brianna was was positive behaviors uh, from a leadership perspective that Brianna was mentioning. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, Oh, thank you, Brianna. Thank you, uh, Alice, and thank you, Lola. And I don't want to monopolize the microphone, uh, so I would encourage um, uh, the folks in the participating in the in the event, uh, our uh, our uh, audience, to to unmute themselves and uh, ask some questions to our uh, to our panelists. We have about twenty minutes, which is pretty uh, uh, like a nice amount of time to. To share, to, to 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 talk, to share, to to reaffirm some of these concepts, to perhaps to to complement them. So, uh, uh, please feel free to unmute uh, and to to participate. Or or to write on the chat too, if you feel more comfortable writing on the chat. Questions, interventions. It's Lola again. One of the things that I wanted to suggest was that we provide volunteers with resources. So, for example, if you know a volunteer has changed job or lost his job or whatever, then when you get some information or a lead, you share with the volunteers, right? And one of the other things that I wanted to suggest is building trust, building trust with the volunteers, building trust between the volunteers and the staff so that they rely on each other and that they believe that there is a great deal of contribution on both sides. That's, that's great. Uh, we, we also have a question from Taranjit. Uh, they say, uh, there was two questions actually. The first one, you can read it, I'll, I'll read it aloud. How would you suggest engaging with young and diverse volunteers for smaller community-based organizations to continue to have, so that they are continue to, to have interest and, and being involved. Uh, so I think perhaps Lola, that, that, that would be a, a question for you. Uh, and then perhaps for, for uh, Alice and, uh, and Brianna, how can we encourage and educate folks around us in the workplace on the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and the need to acknowledge, uh, address, uh, and create a li liaisons of EDI awareness uh, within their bubble for a bigger impact? Okay, uh, my mic is on. All right. So the question is, you know, during COVID-19, all of a sudden we saw a reduction of the involvement of volunteers. And obviously that was due to concerns for their health. The way to get them all back is about making fun, making sure that it's fun. When they volunteer, not only is there an impact to what they're doing, and we make sure that you stress that impact to those 
young people, but also that it can be fun, that it's rewarding, that people appreciate it, that the clients look forward to working with them because they have such energy, such joy, and such optimism. And I think that that's something that you have to model, that as a leader, you have to have so that they look at the way that you're working with them and that they, I'm going to use the word ape them, but that's not really what what I mean, but they follow that, they follow the leader. So I think that that's one of the ways that you can get all of those volunteers, especially from di diverse communities to be involved. The other thing is to go look for leaders of diverse communities and find out if they can help you to get some of these uh, youth from diverse cultures to come and get involved, right? And there's nothing wrong with going to see a community leader and say, hey, I'm doing a small event in this community and I'm looking for some teenagers to help me out. Is there someone I can talk to? Is there somewhere I can go? And then just going from there and then making sure that uh, you value what they can bring and making it fun so that they want to do it. There's such a thing as peer pressure. And there's nothing wrong with getting peer pressure going when you got a group of young people working for a particular event. I hope that answers your question, uh, Taranjeet. Can yes. I also add on to that, Lola? Sure. I, I used to uh, manage volunteers at, well, three different organizations in Ottawa. And I think especially with young people, we have to think about volunteering is often the first thing that goes off the priority list for a young person, right? If they've got to move or they're going to go to university and switch cities or they get a new job, volunteer is going to be the thing that goes by the wayside. Um, so for me, it was always really about what can you give the volunteers back? So I think Lola mentioned earlier training. Mm -hmm. Training benefits your organization because you have better trained volunteers, but it also benefits them because they're building their resume to go find a job in their field. Um, so that's really valuable if your organization can afford to subsidize training or at least get trainers available for different topics. Um, reference letters, like Lola said, are really important, whether young people have figured it out or not. The power of networking, so creating events where they can come together and meet other people. Um, and then showing appreciation, building spaces for them to have community, not just when they're volunteering, but also with other volunteers are all ways that you give back to them. It's gonna strengthen your organization because you're gonna have better trained, more engaged volunteers, but it's also benefits that they get so that when they have to make a decision about their priority list, they don't feel that, well, volunteering can go by the wayside because it's just me giving, giving, giving. It's, well, I actually get a lot from volunteering, so I'm gonna keep that higher on the list and something else can drop off when that decision has to be made. Super well said, Brianna. Thanks, Lola. I, uh, I'm i not going to speak to the EDI piece. I think maybe Alice is better positioned to speak to that. So I'll, I'm going to pass on that question. But Alice, did you want to address that? Yeah, absolutely. I do notice there's a hand up um, from Tracy. So I don't know if that was in relation to what was just shared. Do we want to cover that first? Uh, sh sure, uh, Tracy, if you want to if you want to speak. Hi, hi there. Um, so, of course, like many other organizations, there has been the uh, great resignation and, uh, of course, uh, during COVID. And then um, our organization actually quickly pivoted to having the opportunity to offer virtual events and virtual opportunities for volunteers as well as our participants. So now we are getting back into, well, in person and virtual and hybrid. So a combination of those to really meet the needs of our participants. We certainly learned a lot um, during COVID, which has actually helped our organization in terms of um, recognizing some of the, the gaps that we had in terms of our program offerings. So my question is around not necessarily always being that physical person in a space. So I support Ontario East. So I work out of an office, but I'm going to support volunteers and have virtually in, in Ontario East. But now that we're moving back into person and we're thinking about those, you know, those orientation sessions. And so I'm looking for some, some ideas around understanding that everybody comes to an organization with their own desire to volunteer. 
So being able to know what that is at the very beginning stages of that application to decide what is going to be best for them in an orientation, um, you know, virtual, hybrid, in person, when we physically can't be there in person with everyone, and then supporting those different models throughout, because we know volunteers are, are all very different and unique, and uh, we want them all to feel a part of the team based on what they're, what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this question was directed to me. Is that correct, Tracy? It was to any of the panel. You all have uh, great resources and abilities. So anyone that, that wants to uh, um, answer that. I, am. I, was, I was just going to suggest that during the, the preliminary interview with the volunteers, you want to know what motivated them to come volunteer for your organization and what they'd like to contribute because you know an accountant might not want to be an accountant for your organization they might be wanting to try something new so that interview gives you the, the opportunity to find out what it is that they would like to do for your organization and the other piece that comes with that of course is then how do they want to do it and that's all depending on the placement description that you have for the for, for your organization. If you're looking for someone who's going to be at the door of a uh, you know, two-week event, then you need somebody who is interested in doing just that. So a volunteer who you know, wants to work um, with seniors in a senior center is not the best match. So it depends on the match. It depends on the motivation of the volunteers. And all of that you can find out in that interview before you get to orientation. You know, so, which is a great point. So, so the background is we've always done the orientation first. We do the orientation to the organization. And during our orientation, we talk about all of the different volunteer opportunities, which then moves them into the interview with the appropriate program lead. Um, so, yeah, so I guess, you know, the idea of, of how do we look at that differently now? Mm -hmm. do, you have an, do you have an application process, Tracy, before the orientation? Yes, we do. Yes. So maybe that's a question for your application is, yeah. are you hoping to volunteer in person, virtual or hybrid? Um, do you have any, like, what, how could we accommodate your learning style? And so it's, it's even right before the orientation. It doesn't have to wait for the interview. That, that's great. So being part of the application, how would you like to receive your initial training to the organization? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then obviously during that interview, asking those other um, probing questions, which we, which we do right now in terms of virtual or in person. Thank you very much. You've both uh, been great and answered my question and given me some things to think about. Thanks so much. Want to to okay. thank, thank you, Tracy, uh, and, and thank you, Lola and Brianna. Before we move on to, to the next uh, person who has their hand raised, who's uh, Ismail, uh, I would like to give Alice the chance to answer the question about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion that was posed earlier by Taranjit. Yeah, so, I mean, driving EDI effort has to come from leadership, right? Like, it has to start from the top. There has to be a real commitment um, to build EDI in the workplace. And your leaders, the person, your leadership are going to be the people um, that really drive that as an organizational initiative. Um, the, the, the challenging thing about EDI efforts is that uh, they have to be done. Lots of people don't do them in the best way, right? So I've seen a lot of organizations, um, you know, if you look on job boards, everybody's hiring for a director of equity people, um, a director of you know diversity, equity, inclusion. And what I, I found in some of um, my client work is that ends up happening is that all of the responsibility for the equity work gets put onto one individual. And this is incredibly problematic because when things don't go right, you have a scapegoat and you have a person to blame for the entire organization not moving along their equity journey. And what needs to be very, very clear from the very beginning 
is that EDI efforts cannot fall on just one person. It has to be a collective effort. So every person in the organization has a responsibility to make it an equitable workplace. And that is how you follow, um, how you follow policies and how you engage with your colleagues in the way that you go about your work. It has to be built into everything that everyone does. And this is what I find to be the biggest challenge for organizations to be able to sort of move in that right direction. Um, if your leadership is having <clears throat> a challenge uh, when it comes to recognizing the importance of you know, building equity into the workplace and if they need a nudge, there are lots of great DEI surveys out there to help you gather data from your staff, right? So they might think everything is great in this organization, we're equitable, um, you know, people are happy, but surveys can allow people to confidentially disclose how they really feel in an organization. Do people feel that they can bring their authentic self to work? <clears throat> Do they think that their differences or their, their unique um, um, aspects of themselves are respected in the workplace? Do they feel that there's things happening underneath the surface that you know, your leadership may not see, like microaggressions or just disrespectful behavior? These are things that we need to kind of pull out so that you can really get a sense of how equitable are you? Uh, how equitable are your staff feeling that the organization is and how much do staff feel that you actually value equity in the workplace? That's a great place to start. Um, Cause a lot of the times I will tell you, like I've had clients who feel that they are so equitable and then you run a survey and it is like the results are very stark. People are not, um, they're not feeling the way that you, you thought that they were feeling. Uh Thank you, Alice. Um, I, I don't know if Taranjit has a follow-up uh, to, to their question. Um, Maybe I'll just jump in. Uh, yeah, agreed, Alice. And then the, the concept of implicit bias sort of, sort of covers every organization where we feel we might be acting in a way where implicit biases might be overtaking our unconscious bias. And then um, sort of how how would you recommend talking to people around us who have their own sort of, uh, I would say, uh, network or own sort of leadership positions outside their workplace or anywhere they represent where they could still be liaisons of EDI and they could be advocates of EDI throughout and not just in the workplace. So I just want to be sure um, I understand your question fully. Are you are you asking about whether, um, like, how an individual could bring in, I guess, their own lived experience um, and their own experiences into the workplace to be advocates? Uh, sort of, but like, how could we include every person, maybe in a workplace or in our own sort of network, to make sure they acknowledge the importance of EDI mm -hmm. and they could be. Uh, EDI champions, I would say, and, mm. and sort of how EDI impacts not, even if it's not impacting them, how would it impact their colleagues or peers or anybody around them? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it's it's difficult, right? It's difficult because everyone, um, we, call, we call it an equity journey for a reason, right? Because it is a journey. It is constantly evolving and there's people, people are going to be at different points along the journey as well. <clears throat> I think it's one of those things that's interesting about um, EDI work is that it's not information, it's not content that people are kind of holding near, they're not holding their cards right, uh, you know, to their chest and not sharing information. It's all about educating, having discussions, asking, well, why do you feel this way? Tell me more about why you think that way. And have you thought about it from this perspective? It's, it's having, it's having that open dialogue to bring up those conversations in a courageous way, because in doing so, we spark people to think about a situation from a different perspective, from someone else's shoes, for instance. And I think this is an important way to engage in EDI conversations in your day to day without being, um, without potentially causing contention, because at times that, that is what it could very well lead to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Taranjit, for, for your question. Uh, Ismail, uh, you had uh, the, your hand raised previously. 
I, uh, if you want to if you want to to ask your question hi uh, good evening uh, good evening from india and thank you alvaro for uh, giving an opportunity here and my name is ismail i'm from india i'm working in qatar as a content surveyor and uh, living with uh, disability permanent disability uh, in a wheelchair and I have uh, an experience with volunteering more than 100 events in Qatar and some international events also. And I would like to ask, uh, what are the criteria to uh, selection for the volunteering movies in wheelchair or some any kind of disability? Uh, in my experience, uh, I couldn't see many, many people who is in the wheelchair or some any other kind of disability because uh, I noticed that uh, during we submitted our uh, application, uh, we will put uh, uh, if there is any disability or something like that, uh, we will put yes. Uh, so this is a uh, reason uh, for the el el um, eligible remove removing from us. Uh, many events we miss due to this kind of disability. Uh, what are the criteria for uh, this kind of selection? Thank you, thank you, Ismail. Uh, I, so uh, per, perhaps the yeah, accessibility uh, and and volunteering could be uh, could 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 be sort of like the the theme uh, the uh, behind that the question. Um, Alvaro, if you want, I can probably just throw in a, a comment for him, Ismail. Um, when um, there is a request to, to find volunteers for an event, an activity, or whatever, one of the things that we ask is, what are the requirements for that placement? And sometimes they'll come back and they'll say, well, you're, you have to stand for two hours, or you have to go to the second floor of this particular center. And then what the question that I will ask, well, is it wheelchair accessible? And then that way, that's when I go back and I talk to the volunteers about who wants to, to uh, take advantage of that placement. That's the information I provide. So the position description or placement description really provides the information that you need to so that you can offer it to everyone. And then people who can do it then will apply for that particular position. So just my two cents, I hope that it helps. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, I have uh, received an uh, opportunity from uh, USA Oregon uh, in World Athletic Championship uh, as a volunteer. And this is my concern. Uh, if I am traveling such a long distance from here to Oregon, uh, if I am not able to do some activities, it will be difficult to me and organization. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're raising a very a very important uh, a very important point, Ismail, in terms of the of the importance of, of volunteer uh, descriptions and opportunity descriptions to be uh, to 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 have the uh, as, as as Lola was was bringing up uh, accessibility elements so so that we are not in a sort of ableist mi mindset in terms of, of assuming uh, that that everyone can access a certain activity or a certain, which also builds into to to eat to equity right it's another another i think another complementary part so perhaps you can you, you can if you if you're worried about traveling uh, perhaps you can you can reach out to them uh, and and ask to to accommodate to accommodate you that would be my my uh, honest advice in that in that case i don't know if anyone has a different input oh thank you uh, alvaro uh, i'm also happy to work with the team uh, ottawa volunteers uh, if, if there is any opportunity let me know <laughs> i'm happy to <laughs> serve my skills and time for thank you, you. So much. thank you for thank You're you for welcome. engaging with us Thank have you very much. Have, have a good evening for you, right? You said it was the evening for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we are we are uh, right on 
on the the hour, uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to to uh, go beyond the the time commitment of our wonderful presenters. Uh, what we can do, if you have any uh, uh, outstanding questions, is that you can email them to me. Uh, you should have received my email, and I can redirect them to our panelists. Before you leave, I will ask uh, you to uh, answer a, a poll that uh, Adam will circulate shortly uh, about uh, other types of engagement. That uh, so how how we the, the the overarching theme is that how we, can we recover together? Or how how can Volunteer Ottawa can accompany your organization in in your journey of uh, recovery from from uh, and and adaptation to as as Alice was was saying that this is this is not necessarily over uh, so can how can we accompany you in this in this journey so please uh, fill out that poll that will will create very important information for us in terms of programming uh, and programming other sessions or programming other events so uh, without further ado on my end i thank you all for for taking the time today and i really look forward to seeing you uh, at Volunteer Ottawa events. If you would like to check out our calendar of events, including the education programs offerings, uh, don't, for, uh, don't forget to visit volunteerottawa.ca slash training. Uh, we have a really awesome set of uh, workshops coming up, including one by Brianna uh, in July uh, and a couple of workshops uh, in the next couple of weeks. And surely Lola and Alice um, may also offer uh, uh, trainings with us uh, in the near future. So that's that's a way to stay engaged and to stay uh, up to date with these conversations. So by, your, by all means, uh, check out our website and or, or, or reach out to me. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share the, the website uh, in the chat. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure to have uh this chat today and uh, I hope that we responded to some of the information or responded to some of the issues and questions that you had. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Wonderful conversation, everyone. Yeah, great job. Very nice. Hi, everybody. I don't, I don't know Hi. Christine, our, our EV. Hi, Christine. Hi, Hi Christine. Nice, to, nice to meet you all. You too. Nice to meet you too. Great, to, great collection of perspectives and uh, themes and complementary, but uh, not overlapping. I thought, uh, and the engagement was there right from right from start to end. I think we we started at 24 and ended with 20. So that's uh, that's exceptional over a summer a summer lunch hour, as somebody said. Really good. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for sure. uh, yeah, and Adam's going to put me down for a workshop to give a workshop. Thank you, Adam. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm off to my next uh, next meeting, but uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks again for your uh, for your time and uh, and wisdom. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good day. Bye. Take care. And All right. Before anyone heads off, I'd just love to hear your reflection. Any brief comments, or if you want, sending an email and reflection as well would be wonderful. We want to hope. We're